Welcome to this presentation on two-dimensional elements, and we're going to be developing those. We've looked at one-dimensional elements, so moving on to the second dimension here. So we, uh, again, to, for the setup here, there's no uh, additional files beyond the notes, so if you want to go check out the notes, you can follow along there. They're in the uh, notes folder, and the link is in the description below. So where are we headed in this uh, overall, what we're going to be doing in this presentation, we look at rectangular elements first. Uh, look at linear and non-quadratic rectangular elements. Look at uh, triangular elements and linear as well as quadratic triangular elements. Look at axisymmetric elements and the value of those. And then isoparametric elements. All right, so you can see where we're at here. And again, in the description below, we'll have the index of the times of when each of these are, so you can skip ahead or move around as you need. Oh, sorry, and ANSYS elements as well. And um, basically where these, the ones we're talking about above, show up in the ANSYS elements. Introduction. All right, so we're going to be looking here as the heat transfer through a fin. And we've looked at this before in previous presentations, but what we're going to look at this time specifically is we have the heat that's moving in the X direction, but also in the Y direction. So we don't have like a pin fin, um, very, very small fin, but we do have a fin that's got this 2D piece to it. So that's why we can look at 2D elements on our fin. So the temperature varies in both the X and Y directions, so we're going to use these 2D elements. All right, so second uh, 2D linear rectangular, uh, we're going to do these types of elements in local coordinates first. All right, so one-dimensional solutions are approximate, approximated by line segments, so that's what we've already done. Two-dimensional solutions are approximated by plane segments. All right, so here's our plane segments. So we have globally in the X and the Y directions. We have an overall length here on this side, width on this side. And we have nodes I, J, M, and N. And then we have a local coordinate system there of X and Y. All right, so we have some idea what we're working with here. So before, where it was usually just I and J for linear element, now we have I, J, M, and N because it's a plane element. All right, so temperature distribution here. Again, if we just looked at our elements, here's I, J, M, and N that makes up this overall plane that we're looking at. And if we would plot that temperature distribution, uh, this is what it would look like, for example. So we'd have maybe a higher temperature up here at node N, uh, low temperature down here at M, and then some intermediate temperatures at I and J. It creates this whole plane of temperature uh, that changes across that space. So the approximate temperature distribution in that rectangular, rectangular element is, so the temperature at any point within the element is uh, some constant B, 1, B2, 3, and 4 times the X, Y, and X times Y um, locations where we're at in that element. So we need to develop those, uh, figure what those coefficients are, B1 through 4. All right, so those are unknowns. So we're going to need four boundary conditions. Guess what they're going to be? Right here, right? So you start here, so the temperature at, uh, is equal to Ti at x equals 0 and y equal to 0. So again, here's x, here's y, so this is 0, 0, so that's node i. For j, the temperature at node j here, so we're going to be 0 in the y, but we are uh, some distance L over in the x. Uh, at m, we're out L and w position, x and x, y distances. And for node n, uh, x is 0, but l is w, so the width up. All right, so there are boundary conditions. So we sub those into our equations, excuse me, into the equation. Then we can create four equations with four unknowns. You can solve it simultaneously to obtain b1, 2, 3, and 4. So here's b1 is just the temperature at node i. b2 is 1 over l. Temperature at node J uh, minus the temperature at node I. Uh, one over the width, uh, temperature at node N minus the temperature at node I. And one over the length times the width, temperature at node I minus the temperature at node J plus the temperature at node M minus the temperature at node N. All right, so we put those all together, substitute them back in, and we can figure out the temperature at any location within our elements. So if we know the X and Y coordinates, and then here's X and Y, we can determine the temperature at any point within our element. All right, so if we rearrange this, we can obtain the shape function. So if we rearrange to solve for just the Ti terms, here's Ti, 
STI, and STI, and temperature mode I. Now we can get those different shape functions. So here are the shape functions with local coordinates. All right, so the shape function node I, J, M, and N, based on local coordinates of X, lowercase x and Y. And that's, uh, again, all the stuff we've done before with 1D. Here's how it looks look like looks like when we do it with 2D. All right, we can make this very general, put in our, substitute in our psi. So instead of temperature, we got our psi here for our element. So using the shape functions, we can figure out the psi at any location within the element. And in a matrix form, uh, it's the second equation set up here. All right, so now let's look at uh, 2D linear rectangular, but now in natural coordinates, not um, local coordinates, but natural coordinates. So similar to the uh, 1D case, we're going to be in the center, right? That's where our eta and our, sorry, our chi and our eta are going to be located in the center of our element, but instead of a center of our line segment like it was with 1D, it's going to be in the center of the whole plane. All right. So the relationship between local and natural coordinates, we have uh, chi is 2x over L minus 1, and eta is equal to 2y over the width minus 1. So the 2D linear shape functions and natural coordinates come out to be this. All right. So you can check those out All right. in the development. Again, the same process as we've done before. All right, so we can notice the shape functions still have the properties retained for even when they're natural coordinates. So the shape function at node i is equal to 1 at its own node. So node i and node 1 gives us a value of 1. And so that's when the chi is minus 1 and eta is minus 1. And the same case for the rest. So you can check those out and see if they work. Uh, we also have a uh, shape function at node i is equal to zero at all the other nodes other than i. So node j, m, and n, it's all going to be, shape function is going to be zero. And same with the other three shape functions. And if we add all the shape functions up, we'll get one. So all those are uh, retained. And there's a process similar to the Grange function uh, that we use, again, for 1D case, can be used to generate um, these shape functions. So I'm sure there's a source online and textbooks that you can find to, to do that. All right, so let's move on now. We're going to look at 2D quadratic rectangular element. Right? So not linear, but quadratic. And so now we have an eight-node element. And you see we have I, J, sort of these I, J, M, and N. But now we also have K, L, O, and P. All right, so basically, as it says here, it's a higher-order version of the 2D four node quadratic element. So now we can do kind of this curvy wonky thing here. Um, and it's well suited as you can imagine for curved boundaries. So we can get, not just have a straight line between M and J, but we can also do some curve at L if it gets shifted out a little bit. So for the same number of elements, this element produces better nodal results than the linear four node element. So the four node, uh, linear rectangular and we just looked at because it only has four nodes it doesn't really do curves really well so this one can do that so it ends up giving better node results if you use the same number of elements the approximate solution for this element obviously it gets bigger so now we have eight different coefficients two three four five six seven and eight All right. wow that's a, that's a bunch of stuff to solve for there so using bounded conditions we can solve for those unknowns determine the shape function uh, Determine the shape factors, uh, shape functions is a huge task. All right, so it can take a bunch to do that. Can be done though. For, so for the quarter nodes, we have these guys for I, J, M, and N. And for the midpoint, we have these shape functions um, for K, L, O, and P. All right, so getting using them all the same way as before. So if we go to general notation, we're going to use our psi again. We substitute in our shape functions there with our size values at each of the nodes. Again, we have it in matrix form. And the shape function properties all still apply here. All right, so pretty straightforward. Again, what we're doing here is just showing this for different cases, a lot of repetition that's going to be happening uh, in the development, showing the shape function and things. So hopefully you get that pattern. Um, so it's just the kind of the nuances of how many nodes do we have and how do we uh, locate them. 
So we're going to look now at uh, like triangular elements. Um, so using global coordinates, and these are linear. So right now we just have three nodes. We got I, J, and K. And so this is just kind of the overall shape of that element. And then if we actually looked at the the pattern of the temperature across that element, we could have something like this. So that's the temperature distribution. All right. So again, on a fin, it could look like this. We have all these triangular elements uh, across the fin. So again, temperature can vary in both the x direction as well as the y direction. So that's why we use the 2D elements. The linear element is better suited for curve boundaries than the linear quadru quadrilateral element um, because it's we can get in there and fit the curve boundary better than the quadrilateral, quadrilateral element. The approximate temperature distribution in the triangular element is this. So we got three coefficients, a1, a2, and a3 to solve for. So three unknowns, uh, a1, 2, and 3. So we need three boundary conditions, and I bet you can guess what they are at this point. All right, we're going to find the temperature. We know the temperature at node I, J, and K, and we can locate those by its position at X, um, global position XI and YI, J and J, and K and K. So we're going to substitute that back in, solve for A1, 2, and 3 simultaneously. All right, when we do that, we get these. So a lot, uh, a little bit more complex than the quadrilateral elements. All right, so a lot more terms in here, but we've already solved for here the temperature um, at node I, J, and K. It looks like I kind of lost this bracket over here. So we can close the bracket here. Right. Where area is the area of the triangular element. And that comes from, so if we want to calculate this area here, we would uh, take 2 times A, we could um, determine it from the rest of the location of the coordinates on the corners of our triangle. So rearrange that algebraically and to obtain the shape functions at uh, nodes i, j, and k. So with our global coordinates, shape function at node i is kind of simplifying 1 over 2a. We've got this alpha now, this alpha at node i, beta at node i, and the delta at node i. And so you may be wondering what those are. It's just kind of a grab some terms here so it collects these terms of uh, x and y for alpha, for beta, and for delta. So and again, simplifies it, cleans it up a bit. And the shape function properties are still enforced. In this case, they still show up in the triangular element. All right, so now we're going to look at the uh, triangular elements. It's still linear, but we're going to do it with natural coordinates. All right, so we got uh, we have zero on the one corner. And in this case, we use lambda going from i to k, and lambda is going to be 1 at k. Uh, starting at k, we get uh, eta. Eta goes from 0 at k to 1 at j. And then we got chi. Chi is 0 at j and goes to 1 at i. All right. So we have all those. So we, we added lambda now here on in addition to uh, chi and eta from the past usage of natural coordinates. All right, so for our triangular elements, we use areas to find the natural uh, area coordinates. So we have uh, chi is our uh, area of 1 divided by the overall area of the triangle. So I'll just go back here and highlight that. All right, so here's area 1. All right, so that area is made up between nodes k, p, and j. p is at the center, the geometry, geometric center of our, of our element. Um, and then area two is I, K, and P. Area three is I, J, and, and P. So that's where we're coming from for these A's that we see in the numerator. And so observation, hopefully we can see that if, if area is made up of one, two, and three, if we add up these three guys, they equal one. And uh, hopefully that kind of rings a bell. These actually are the shape functions. So chi, eta, and lambda are the shape functions for this uh, triangular element. So therefore, we'll say chi is the shape function at node i, eta is the shape function at node j, and lambda is the shape function at node k. So they are find previously already at the linear triangular elements. Um, you saw them with the global coordinates. So we already have those defined. All right, so pretty straightforward there. Now let's look at quadratic triangular elements. So quadratic, we're using, oops, let me get 
and their quadratic natural coordinates. All right, so we got this extra node here in the middle. Um, so L, uh, N, and M, along with I, J, and K on the on the corners. Right, we get, if we do this in natural coordinates, so we still have uh, chi, lambda, and eta up here. And you can see how we can get this curve shape. So uh, very good element to use. So this is a six-node quadratic tri tri triangular element. It's basically a higher-order version of the 2D three-node triangular element. So we saw this with, uh, with the um, rectangular elements before. For the same number of elements, this element produces better nodal results than a linear three-node element. So it kind of makes sense. you got some more nodes. You can do some curves better than the three-node. So the approximate solution here, we got uh, now three coefficients we got to deal with, a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And so we're going to need temperature at each one of those six nodes. We can solve for those coefficients and develop the shape functions, the natural coordinates. We go through the same process if we can get the shape functions at nodes i, j, k, l, m, and n. And we can see them all here in terms of chi, eta, and lambda. All right, and we do those in uh, matrix form if we substitute in our psi. So we'll go general here. And again, that psi can be temperature, velocity, displacement, anything um, that makes sense as we develop, depending on what the problem we're solving here. Sorry, this is probably the most commonly used um, element. Um, triangular element is very, very popular when people are doing um, grids and meshing. All right, stretch break here. Been going for a bit. Again, very re repetitious. Um, but uh, again, if you move around and check the notes below uh, for different times, if you want to uh, jump ahead or move back. All right, so let's look at axisymmetric elements. So these are used in special cases of 3D problems where ge uh, the geometry and loading are symmetrical about an axis. So typically the axis of symmetry is the z-axis and all the elements are rotated around it. So in this case, we got an axis of symmetry right here along the z. And if everything else is symmetric, the forces on this are symmetric, then the forces applied to this element here and or here will be the same. And for the triangular element there and here will be the same. So we can just look at this case right here instead of looking at this as well. And then basically, minimizes the amount of computational time and expense it costs us if we can just look at this one side over here. All right. So because of this symmetry, we can use 2D elements instead of uh, 3D elements. It is a 3D problem. right? It's, a, it's got some uh, thickness to it. Uh, we're going to examine two types of 2D axisymmetric elements. We've got the triangular and the rectangular. So let's look at those. So if we look, remember the, uh, and you can go back to this as well, but uh, the, re the general solution for a linear triangular element and its associated shape function. So this is the one where 1 over 2 times the area of the triangle uh, times that alpha, beta, and delta, which is just cleaning things up. So that's the overall form there. So typically with axis symmetric triangular elements, we're going to just use R, the radius, and Z coordinates. So we just need to convert our shape functions from x and y to the r and z coordinates. Right? So let's do that conversion here. You can see here, so um, we've got kind of here's our r going out here. Here's our z. All right, so we're going to have r's going this direction. So essentially where x was before and z where our y was before. So xi will go to r at node i. And y at node i will be now z of node i. And we'll do that for node J as well as node K. All right, pretty simple conversion. All right, so our shape function is, again, the same structure here is, um, for the shape function, except we have, uh, instead of X, we have R there, and instead of Y, we have Z all right, for each one of these. And alpha and beta and delta all change to, instead of having X and Y, there's now R and Z as we go through here. And these are all in terms of Z, and these are all in terms of R. All right, so pretty straightforward conversion there. So for the rectangular elements, right, we have these 
basic uh, matrix setup for uh, the psi term. And the shape functions are as shown here that we have, again, the local coordinates there. So we just need to convert those over to our radius and Z form. So now we got your radius and Z, R and Z, and it's gonna replace R, X, and Y that we have there. All right, so the conversion here is a little bit more involved. So we don't go straight, we go from uh, the local form of the radius to our global radius coordinate plus the original x local co co coordinate um, that converts over to if we want to just replace for x in all our equations so x is equal to the local radius minus the uh, global radius to node i right, and we also have the length change so the length is the difference between um, the arc coordinate at node i and node j and the width is the difference between the coordinates for z at node i and n. So substitute those into the 2D linear rectangular shape functions, and we obtain the axisymmetric rectangular shape functions. All right. So for axisymmetric rectangular elements, our shape functions become right here. So again, pretty much the same form, a lot of substitution for r and x as would be expected. All right, so let's run this as an example. Uh, we got uh, the overall coordinate system here of R and Z, uh, nodes I, J, M, and M. We got temperatures defined at the coordinates there, at the nodes. Uh, we got the locations here. So we want to find the temperature right, at R equal to 3.5. So we got R equal to 2. So what, 7 minus 2 is 5. So we want to do 3.5. So right in here for R, Z is equal to 3. All right, so three, so one, four, one minus four is three. All right, so we go somewhere up in here. So we're gonna find the temperature right, right around this area right here. All right, so let's see what we can, how we do this. So there's our uh, setup here. So if we solve this equation, so this is just a, a series of uh, simultaneous equations. Uh, we need the shape function at node i. So that's um, the global coordinate to node j minus the r coordinate of the point we want to find times the z coordinate to node n minus the z location of the uh, coordinate we want to find. So the length along the bottom here is 5, so we got that in there. The width was 3, so both those, these are all inches. Um, the radial location to r is 7 inches. Uh, the r that we said for the location we want to find was 3.5. Uh, z location to node n is 4 inches, and the z at the point we want to find is 3 inches. So solving that, we get 0.233. We do the same for node j. For node m. And the shape function for node n. Right, so you can go back again and check that. All right, so we're going to plug those back in. Solve for our temperatures. So there's the uh, shape value for the shape function we just saw for in the previous slide. Uh, here are all the temperatures that we know from the nodes from the initial uh, problem statement. And so if we just do the matrix math here, we're going to take this row and multiply it by this column. So 0.233 times 50 plus 0.1 times 40, et cetera, et cetera. So here we go. So we got 0.233 times 50 plus 0.1 times 40, et cetera, for the last two terms there. Add them up, and we get 59.3 degrees Fahrenheit, excuse me, for the temperature at that particular location within our element. All right, so hopefully that's again, pretty straightforward. It's stuff we did with a one-dimensional case. It's just moved on to the second dimension here. All right. So uh, isoparametric elements, not a whole lot to say here uh, besides stuff that we've already covered. Um, but we have U, uh, capital U, describes the nodal displacements in the global coordinates. And our lowercase uv describes displacements within the element, so local coordinates, uh, in the x and y directions respectively. So uh, if we look at the local uh, position of, or local displacement in this case, within the element, we can use that based on the shape functions and our global locations at each element. 
Right? So if we recall from before, when we use a single set of parameters, uh, or shape functions, uh, to define unknown variables, so we define mainly temperature in this example because we're looking at a, at a fin, but we could also do displacement as well as velocity and for our psi. Um, and if we can use a single set of parameters to express the geometry, then we are using an isoparametric formulation. All right, so hence these types of elements are called isoparametric elements. And you can see we talked about this before in a previous presentation, get some more information on that. But again, because it can extend to multiple things, uh, it's iso, it's constant for the parameter. Um, so we can use these again and again. So that's the big value of shape functions. So we can develop them once and use them for multiple uh, different different uh, occasions and applications. All right, so here are the overall elements developed. I know this is kind of small, but um, kind of a nice summary of all the shape functions here for a linear rectangular uh, element here. All right, so you got both local coordinates and uh, natural coordinates. Uh, quadratic, quadrilateral, so all the natural coordinates for all eight nodes. Uh, linear rectangular, so you got your shape functions in node i, j, and k. And quadratic triangular, so all those in natural coordinates. All right, so in matrix form, what that, um, these local uh, displacement forms that come out to, we got shape function node i would be multiplied times the displacement um, at node i in the x direction, because this u is in the x direction. And then we'd have to do on the separate line here, the displacement in the um, v's, the displacement in the y direction uh, locally would be based on the uh, displacement um, at node i in the y direction. So we can use the uh, natural coordinate shape function developed previously. It's a substitute in here to the, for the shape functions. And they can also be used to describe the position of any point within the element. All right? This seems like it would make pretty good sense of what the, how that would uh, be done, but instead of doing it based on the shape function, usually based on natural uh, coordinates or global coordinates, and then you could get them based on a, a local coordinate basis uh, within each element. All right, so again, for 2D elements and ANSYS, uh, probably the thing that's gonna give you the most uh, information, go to ANSYS help, and you can search for uh, the different elements that you're interested in using. Uh, same for 3D elements as well. Uh, you can also look at the notes. The notes will have some information about some of the elements that they use in ANSYS and, and how they're used, um, um, how many nodes they have. Um, there's one specifically for structurals, one specifically for thermal. Um, so I'll let you look at those in the, in the notes. Again, if you have any questions, put them in the comments below and uh, hope to see you at the next presentation. Thanks.